Uh, welcome to the first in a series of online talks called The Quilt in Focus. My name is Judith, I'm with an organisation called Queer Culture Ireland and I'm here in collaboration with Dublin LGBT Pride running these talks today. Um, we're in the beautiful surroundings of Outhouse, so I'd like to thank the people at Outhouse and our partners Dublin LGBT Pride for making this all happen. And today we're starting with something very special. It's a discussion around the Dice Man, um, also known as Tom McGinty. Tom was a street performer in Dublin and also an LGBT and political activist in Dublin in the 90s, 1980s and 90s. Tom was diagnosed with AIDS in 1990 um, and became quite active in the AIDS activism side of things too. He was a man of huge imposing presence fantastic talent in what he did and an amazing sense of honesty about his world. He gave the LGBT community a presence in the centre of Grafton Street at the heart of the city at a time when it was actually a criminal act to be gay in Ireland. Um, he was so beloved that when he was diagnosed with AIDS the Dublin community came together and supported him during this time. And today I have with me um, one of Tom's closest friends, Aidan Murphy, and he's going to talk to us about Tom's life and his memories of Tom. Thanks so much for joining us, Aidan. How are no you? No problem. I'm delighted to be here. Thank you so much. So I guess a lot of people are going to be watching this. Some who, like myself, remember Tom from the streets of Dublin. Others who may have just heard the name or may not know of him at all. So let's start by just talking about who he was and how he started in this whole world of performance. Okay, well, Tom was a uh, Glaswegian, although he regarded himself as an Irishman, having spent a lot of his childhood uh, summers in Baldy Glass in Wicklow. But he came over to Ireland in 1976, and uh, he'd had a background in Scotland in the theatre and in life modelling. So uh, he came over to Ireland, or over to Dublin for, uh, he had a job in, lined up in NCAD, but it didn't materialise straight away. So he found himself without any funds. So he went to the old uh, Dandelion Market, which is where uh, the Stevens Green Shopping Centre roughly will be now, up in Stevens Green. And um, he dressed himself up in a costume and makeup, and he had a bowl and it said something to the effect of in love with the country but can't afford to stay here <laughs> and uh, people would put money into his uh, into his bowl and he'd uh, give them a wink and I think when he became a bit more confident he stood up I think he started off sitting down mm -hmm. and uh, from that time he became at that time he was known as the dandelion clown he, he got his name from from the place when he, he was becoming known as the dice man the way that came about he, in the early 80s he was working for a shop to advertise a shop called the dice man it was a games shop and um it, it had various locations but all in, or in on grafton street or very near to grafton street the south Anne street area and uh uh, at one stage I remember he was performing I think at Fifth Avenue there was a little arcade and he would gather a huge crowd around him and it would mm -hmm. block up the street a bit yeah. so the guards told him he couldn't he had to move he couldn't just stand still he had to move and that's how his uh, his famous slow walk developed so thank you Gardy. You've mentioned that to me before that quite often when he was on the street he was attacked or people would try to antagonize him um, can you tell us a bit about that That's yeah well I, I suppose when you're putting yourself out there in the street I mean when Tom was out there he was the most visible person in the whole street I mean if you can imagine a graph and street thronged and there was this guy and he was the focus of attention and I suppose mm -hmm. when you put yourself up like that you're going to get all sorts of reaction I mean most people will stop and stare <laughs> And then they might get a wink and that's fine but you know some people uh, might would get very antagonistic and you know sometimes you'd get a bit of aggression people would throw things at times uh, in the early years he used to perform barefoot and he told me that people would put uh, would throw down butts lit butts cigarette butts and he said he'd feel the heat just before he stood and he'd just move his foot 
and and he was he was not very often but yeah. it's not the type of thing you want to happen uh, he was set on fire on more than one occasion and uh, you know that could be one time could be one time too many it's incredibly brave to do this type of street performance where you're putting yourself out there gosh yeah with so little protection yeah. and the idea that people are trying to attack you and all that but certainly from my perspective one of the things i adore about tom is that he was quite an openly gay man and a lot of his performance was around lgbt activism and making those statements i wonder as a person who knew him obviously um was he openly gay about that and was he you know somebody who didn't try to hide that side of himself certainly he was. came across in his performance obviously. yeah no tom he was a very uh larger than life character in every way and I, I remember when we were in the flat in uh, in in uh, in the 70s in in um we uh tom was i think we were there only a short while and he told us that he was a gay man you know and he he wouldn't have made any bones about it uh but he was he was very uh, he was very larger than life in all you know in his voice in, in his appearance everything and it's not something he would have tried to hide and you know i think he really put himself out there especially when he was out performing on the yeah. street yeah, you know and uh must have had a big I, I think it did have a big influence on everybody mm. on gay people and straight people but for, yeah. for gay people to see somebody put himself out there and so visible mm. uh, and he did become quite famous you know yeah. um uh, so, yeah, no, no, he was very openly gay, yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. Now, I, like I said, I just love the idea that at a time when, you know, it was basically criminal act to be openly gay, that here was this beautiful, beloved man in the centre of Grafton Street and very proud to be gay and quite camp in the way he had costumes made and yeah, yeah. that presence that he had. A lot of what he did was obviously there was early theatre, and the street performance piece and you mentioned that a lot of that was commercial um, but there was also a different side to his performance the political and the LGBT activism side can you tell us a little bit about that yeah if Tom was uh, I mean he, he got commissions for most of his costumes but if something was going on or something that he felt strongly about he would go out and uh, make a statement by performing mm. uh, and one of the uh, one of the performance pieces he did, he made up this um, costume called the, what he called the Bloody Visual, and he it was basically a white uh, gown uh, spattered in blood, and then to to mimic that on his face, he would have a white white makeup and bloody eye, and maybe his blood on the face, and quite artistically done, but it would make a point. Over this side, Aidan, we have a fantastic selection of costumes. These are most of the ones that you brought today for us to see. Um, and I know you mentioned that a lot of these at the top were more the commercial side of what Tom was working in. So you want to briefly tell us a little bit about those? I think the one we have behind you here, we, we made a, a, a number of uh, variations on this one. Tom would have been very influenced by Japanese colour in, in the visual sense and mm. these costumes and even some of the makeup um, so we, we we made a number of these costumes that did very dramatic arm pieces hanging down uh, generally speaking it would have been for it might have been for Oki computers or Japan I think they were a fashion shop were they? Yeah. Japan mm -hmm. you know something yeah. that, that had an Eastern uh, or Japanese uh, connection and I think we alluded to the purple suit earlier on that mm -hmm. was casual wear <laughs> <laughs> I can't remember exactly what this one was for again I think the, the, with the, the, the squares and triangles mm. and circles again I think it might have had a, a Japanese yeah. uh, uh, connection um, this one here was one of the costumes that Tom made for that he wore uh, for Bewley's uh, he was a wizard there was a pointed hat to go with that and he would have done a lot of work for Bewley's mm. over the, you know as uh, I think I remember him once we made up this big huge brack and there was a big bite taken out of it and Tom was Dracula <laughs> after taking the bite out of the brack and we had him in uh, an egg 
costume for mm. Easter again for Bewley. So we did. There was a lot of work for Bewley's at, at, around that time. Mm -hmm. um, the other costume up there is part of a, um, a Valentine's Day costume, and then this one behind me here was from the infamous um, Rocky Horror uh, promotion. Um, there was a show, uh, a Rocky Horror show to be staged in the SFX uh, in Dublin, and uh, it's a venue that no longer exists. Mm. But um, Tom was employed anyway to promote this on the street, and in line with the, the show, he wore a very risque costume, which involved the Basque here, a big feather kind of mm -hmm. headpiece and uh, fishnet stockings and uh, he allegedly bared his buttocks and this is how he fell foul of the law. We're standing in front of the AIDS Memorial Quilt or it was originally called the Names Project when it first started off and the panel down here um, is the one that's dedicated to the Dice Man I really like this one just on a personal level because he's depicted as Dracula and I mentioned this to you Aidan that my uncle is Paddy Dracula and I knew that they were friends and I met him briefly through that so do you want to tell us a little bit about his Dracula days? <laughs> yeah it was this was um, a very popular uh, character I, I, I think I, I can't remember why, how he did it or when, why he did it at first but it was hugely popular for entertainment where you weren't Sometimes it was used for promotions, but it, it would tend to be if he was going to a festival and just for pure entertainment. But it, you might get a sense of it, a little sense of it here. That, that's a, a reasonable rendition. And uh, it, was, it was fairly scary looking. And uh, I, I remember um, a few times it kind of, over, I mean, obviously that was part of the, the, the appeal because when he was doing this, if he was in a huge crowd of sit setting, instead of, he might wink at people, but what he'd do is he'd find somebody and he'd run after them, <laughs> you know, and pretend to bite their neck or something like this. And there'd be screams and pandemonium, you know, and a great laugh. Tragically, obviously, the reason he has a panel is that Tom was diagnosed with HIV. Yeah. Do you recall when that was? Did yeah, I think it was in, if I remember rightly, we, uh, we, <sighs> I think Tom wanted us to be to insure ourselves against injury or whatever. Uh, I can't remember the exact nature nature of the insurance, but both of us uh, both of us were required to take an AIDS test, and unfortunately, Tom's came back uh, positive, uh, and that was in 1990, I think, and it was a huge, huge shock. I mean, you know as you can imagine I, I think he had suspicions and he had mentioned it to me before he had suspicions that he there was a possibility he could be HIV mm -hmm. but it's one thing you know suspecting and another thing for it to come back in writing and when he was diagnosed in 1990 uh, he was in reason he was in reasonably good health and he, he stayed in reasonably good health for a few years but unfortunately I think in 1993 he very suddenly, uh, as it appeared to me, his behaviour changed very suddenly and we later discovered that he was suffering from atrophy of the brain which afflicts some people who have AIDS. Uh, I was definitely featured in the recent uh, TV show uh, It's a Sin where one of the characters, it was the first time I'd ever seen any other character, uh, any, I'd known anybody else being portrayed with this yeah. with this um, condition, and it, it basically it's like a dementia, a type of dementia, mm -hmm. and uh, it affects your behaviour. So once that kicked in with Tom, he went from a very gradual decline and reasonably good health, not mm -hmm. hundred percent, but uh, he, then he went into rapid decline and. I'd say within a matter of weeks, uh, I'd say almost straight away, he wasn't able to do his Dice Man routine. Uh, one of the things I noticed, he lost the focus, that look, that steely look. Mm -hmm. He I lost that almost immediately and um, he wouldn't have been aware. There's that kind of, I forget what you call it, and they alluded to it as well in, that, in the show, it's in, mm -hmm. that the person 
isn't doesn't know what it's proper to do mm. in all sorts of ways from a safety point of view from hygiene uh, legally mm. uh, okay. it's like Tom at the time I remember one time I think he he was still driving we were trying to we were trying to work out a way to stop him driving because we didn't think it was safe and uh, the doctors would say to him Tom if you don't feel well you're not to drive mm. and he would come out and say I feel fine something wrong with me because <laughs> in his own head he would think I'm, I'm okay I feel okay and when he at a certain stage in uh, October of 2004 he uh, he appeared on the Late Late Show and he spoke mm. about his illness and he was very ill himself at that stage and a very very impressive uh, I, I really couldn't believe it at the time how he he, he, he pulled everything together because he, you know his, the atrophy had really uh, affected him at that stage and yet he was able to sit up there and talk mm -hmm. not only talk to Gay Byrne at the time but he was able to talk to the nation and I remember on a number of occasions he spoke to the camera he spoke to everybody in the country and you know asked people if they they could told people that they could mm -hmm. do, ring him and talk to him if they had any concerns and yeah. you know he's very very impressive really yeah hugely impressive I mean that late late show appearance is extremely moving and extremely brave for exactly that he talks so openly and honestly about his illness and then he reaches out and offers support for anyone yeah. who's and going through see, it and yeah. it's very he's very visibly Absolutely. ill in it, you yeah, know you can definitely. see anybody can yeah. see but so, also yeah. what's nice is at the start of that late late show appearance he comes in with a crown and the cloak that's behind you there and that's that right. was in relation to a tribute event that had been run just before that. So do you want to tell yeah, us about that? Yeah, I think that? it was just before, in yeah. October of uh, 1994. Uh, I think it was Susie Kennedy's instigation and she did some sterling work in putting that together. Uh, we, we set up a, a, a benefit for Tom because mm. at that stage he, uh, he could no longer work and we just wanted to have some financial security for him so that, that this is something he didn't need to worry about none of us you know none of us needed to worry about mm -hmm. and uh, Susie uh, very kindly took that on and put together this great event where a number of performers uh, entertained us for the night it was a fancy dress ball everybody dressed up and at the end of it all Tom wore this uh, costume this cloak behind us I'll tell you where it came from in a minute <laughs> And he, uh, Gavin Friday, very kindly crowned him the king of the uh, high king of the street performers, and it was a lovely event. Mm -hmm. It was great fun. It was a lovely event. It was nice to honour somebody when they're still mm -hmm. in the land of the living, and mm -hmm. he really enjoyed it. We couldn't get him off the stage <laughs> at the end. <laughs> but the the costume here, this unusual looking cloak, Tom loved this this costume, and he where he got it came from Russia. We had, uh, you know, in 1989, when he was in South Carolina performing in um, Salome, around that time the Berlin Wall fell. And roll on a few years, in uh, 1993, uh, we worked for an Irish company who had a joint venture with the Russian state, I think they were a telecommunications company, and somebody came up with the great idea of having a Paddy's Day parade in Moscow. So somebody else piped up and said let's get the dice man over there so over we went and in the same parade there was these horsemen called the Cabardinians. Uh, I think it was in connection with the, uh, the place where they, they came from anyway the Cabardinians were horsemen and they wore this cloak on their shoulders and when Tom saw this he had to have one just had to have one so Obviously, Tom passed away then February, 20th of February, That's right, 1995. Yeah. And this event, us putting this out today, is actually to mark his anniversary. Um, do you have any last memories of Tom that you'd like to share just before we finish? You know, when you think even back a few years before when uh, Vincent Hanley died, there was a shroud of secrecy about, mm. and it must have been terribly difficult for that man, mm -hmm. uh, there's this shroud of secrecy about the whole thing. Tom McGinty died from AIDS 
uh, publicly acknowledged it mm. and he was when he did die he lived with, with AIDS first and when he did die he was carried his coffin was carried from the very top of Grafton Street all the way down uh, by uh, uh, an army of his friends uh, Six, we started off with six people, six pallbearers at the top of Graven Street. They would walk maybe 10 metres and six more people took them all. Mm. And then, so we all carried them down the street and outside Bewley's, halfway down, there was a big spontaneous round of applause. I'm going to just finish. I have a quote here and it's from the obituary that Dermot Bulger wrote for Tom. Um, in 1995 so just to read this out to you because I think it's really lovely and it says he was our king the king of everyone ever called a faggot or queer or weirdo or blow in of everyone who ever dared to truly be themselves and even those too scared to try of everyone eccentric or outcast or different he was the high king of all the diversity without which any society cannot grow nicely said fantastic Thank you so much, Aidan, for your time and for bringing all your costumes. It's been a real pleasure talking to you. Thank you, Judith. Thank you. You're welcome.